Good afternoon and welcome. Buenas tardes, bienvenidos. Welcome to Via Voices. This is a weekly uh, series in which we uh, have uh, engaging conversation with friends and allies from our Via International Network. And uh, we've been uh, rotating themes this uh, spring season, talking about Via's work in global education and uh, Via's work in uh, community development. Uh, today, we're uh, talking with a uh, an emphasis on our VIA's longstanding interest in the cultural heritage of the U.S.-Mexico borderlands. Uh, as many of you know, uh, VIA International has served for many, many years as the fiscal sponsor of the Chicano Park Steering Committee, and also as a fiscal sponsor for the Friends of Friendship Park, the advocacy coalition working to protect and preserve access to the meeting place at the U.S.-Mexico border. And with our staff uh, rooted both here in San Diego and also in Tijuana through our sister organization, uh, Los Niños de Baja California, Via International is a very much uh, a, an organization rooted in the San Diego Tijuana borderlands and very invested in protecting and preserving and celebrating the cultural heritage of the borderlands. And so it's a, a real pleasure for me to, to today to welcome Paul Espinosa. Uh, Paul is a filmmaker, uh, who has invested uh, his career in, in uh, doing much of the same work through the, the medium of film. A remarkable career and, and body of work. Uh, we'll touch on a, some, of the, some of the range of themes that Paul has, uh, has uh, addressed in his filmmaking across uh, decades now. Uh, but I want to start with uh, in conversation with Paul about his most recent film, called Singing Our Way to Freedom, which is a, a profile of uh, uh, Ramon Chunky Sanchez, the uh, Mexican-American uh, uh, Chicano uh, musician who uh, was so central in the life of Chicano Park and in the life of the Fronteriza culture here in San Diego for so many years. So uh, it's with my great pleasure that I welcome Paul Espinosa to Via Voices. Will you join me with a round of applause? Uh, and Paul, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, very happy to be here, John. Really, uh, really pleased with all the work that you're involved in and happy to be joining you today. Thanks so much. Well, and just uh, let me begin by saying thank you uh, for that wonderful film, uh, Singing Our Way to Freedom. I can't tell you how much I enjoyed it. And I know that uh, several others in our VIA team uh, remarked how moving they found it to, uh, to hear the music and to, to learn more, uh, for me at least, to learn so much more about the person of uh, Ramon Chunky Sanchez. Paul, when did you first meet uh, uh, Chunky Sanchez? Well, I met Chunky really when I first came to San Diego, not long after I first came to San Diego, which was in the, the late 70s. Uh, I think, um, I can't remember the exact time when we met, but I came here in the late 70s and started uh, basically making films broadly on the Chicano Latino community, as well as the, uh, the border, the US-Mexico border region. And I think that um, our paths cross on many occasions. I, I would be at different, um, I don't know, events, uh, cultural events, uh, political events, demonstrations, rallies. So we, we cross paths very, very early on. And um, I got to know him, you know, pretty well. I actually, he did, uh, he did, he scored music for a, a few of my earlier films back in the 1980s. Um, so he was somebody that I, that I knew for, for many years and definitely you know, admired the kind of work that he did in terms of really, um, you know, building community in the larger sense. And I think that was a very important uh, and in some cases unrecognized uh, part of, of what he was all about. And did you have in mind early on, it uh, sounds like you, as you say, you admired his work from early on. Did you have in mind that someday he might be the subject of a film of yours or did that, uh, did this idea come to you um, more recently? The film was just released, uh, was, it, was it just last year, am I right? Yeah, it's been out about about two years now. Um, okay. Well, no, I think originally I, I wasn't necessarily thinking about a film. I did actually, um, in the early 90s, I did bring uh, Chunky and his group into the studio and did a, a, a performance show. In fact, in, in the film, we see uh, there's, there's several pieces of performance in front of a live audience. And that's something that I did in the early 1990s because I felt, I felt it was really, you know, important to sort of capture you know, an example of, of his performance, especially with in an ideal, in a studio setting, basically. Uh, but it wasn't until later that I, I really felt, um, 
you know, that really doing something more ambitious was was called for. I did uh, was also uh, collaborating. Uh, this film, like many of my films, is really a collaboration with many different people. Uh, one of the other people, two other people that were really important in, in uh, sort of getting the film off the ground were Mark Day and, and Keena McQuinney. And the three of us uh, at a certain point felt, uh, actually, I don't think we really necessarily knew whether we would do a film, but one of the things that I felt was really important was to sit Chunky down and do a very extended interview with him. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I did um, Oh, back I think in 2004, and um, and and actually that interview really is the the spine of the film. Uh, we 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 see him at different points in the film, and even if we don't see him, the audio from that interview was very central to to constructing the film. And it was like I say, just a very um, extended uh, discussion conversation with him about you know about his life, about his work, and um, he was very uh, you know. Uh, you know, well, basically, Chucky was a very charismatic person, you know, very uh, a great speaker. You know, he was really wonderful on the stage as a performer. And I think we were able to capture uh, capture that certainly in his in the interviews that we did with him, as well as in some of the you know, we, we obviously also shot, you know, performances with him. Well, really more, let's say more recently, although recently is, you know, the early 90s and the, and the you know, 2006, of course, the film begins with this a very important uh, demonstration in San Diego in 2006, the, the um, uh, basically the protest against the Sensenbrenner bill, which uh, was going to make felons of all undocumented people. And that was part of a larger national effort, uh, really one of the largest um, political demonstrations in, in US history, certainly around Latino issues, where, where people came out, millions of people came out in you know, Los Angeles and Phoenix, Chicago, really all over the country, Houston, uh, to really protest this. And here in San Diego, that was the largest a political demonstration in San Diego history. About fifty thousand people came out, and yeah. anyway, we were able to film that, and that's that's kind of where we begin the film, just to kind of give a feel for uh, Ch Chunky's uh, activism, really, and the, the the way music played into that. And I know by that time, as you trace in the film, he had really become quite an icon of the civil rights movement and of Chicano uh, music and culture and activism here in San Diego. But I, I do want to get to that spine and for those who may not be quite so familiar with Chunky's biography. But before that, I just got to pick up on something you mentioned, which is I'm, fam I'm very familiar with Mark Day. Uh, Mark, who was a, a, a priest uh, uh, and one of Cesar Chavez's priests during the farm worker movement, uh, no longer a Roman Catholic priest, but has remained active his entire career in advocating for uh, farm workers and day laborers and other workers uh, here in the San Diego borderlands. Uh, but tell me about your other, uh, you mentioned a, another a person who was a, a collaborator with you in this? Well, that was uh, uh, Kino McQuinney, who's a musician who's actually in the film, also interviewed in the film. He was a, uh, he's younger, uh, a different generation than let's say Mark and I, but uh, he was, um, he had actually, has his own uh, band, uh, uh, you know, a big mountain that some people may know, but also somebody that was, uh, I would say somebody that was influenced by Chunky and also certainly understood the value, the importance of Chunky and his story to, you know, to future generations. And, and he played often with Chunky and we see him performing in, on a number of occasions in the film and he's also interviewed in the film. Uh, so he's sort of, you know, let's say part of the next generation, which I think was also important. We, I mean, certainly in the film, besides telling Chunky's story, you know, basically a biographical film about Chunky's, you know, beginning in, in Blythe, California, where he was born and sort of the, his kind of evolution and development as a, as a person. We also talk a little bit about, you know, the, the, Im the impact and the influence that he had on a younger generation. Uh, you know, many, many young people, not necessarily just, just musicians, but people that saw him perform and certainly felt, you know, felt, um, you know, inspired by, by what he was talking about and, and certainly remember him coming to, to let's say, their schools when, he, when they were in high school or, or certainly or, or remember him performing. And I think that was also kind of an important, uh, uh, you know, passing of the baton, passing the culture and history on to the next generation, something that Chucky did, I think, very, very effectively. Well, uh, well, kudos to all of you again for uh, the collaboration that produced this film. Let's do uh, just trace real briefly for some in the audience who may be less familiar with Chunky's biography. You mentioned that he uh, was raised in Blythe, California. I really resonated with that, having worked for several years in the Imperial Valley. And uh, he, he describes, or you, you, kept, you capture him describing in the film that one of his first real breakthroughs was just coming to San Diego, leaving the Imperial Valley and coming to San Diego was kind of a revelation to him, as it is for many you know, young kids who grow up uh, in, in uh, rural 
uh, Imperial Valley. Uh, and then this, that, that kind of began a search for identity, which you chronicle, I think, so beautifully. Uh, that theme of identity has been a big topic of conversation as we talk about the U.S.-Mexico borderlands and Chicano culture. Uh, but uh, from Blythe, uh, describe just this brief, uh, this pathway, this spine of the film that Chunky followed. Yeah. Well, yes, uh, Chunky was born in Blythe and his, his parents both were, were, were immigrants, you know, uh, and they came from northern Mexico. Uh, his father was, you know, worked as a farm worker, eventually became a foreman. In fact, in the film, we, there's a very important scene where Chunky recalls overhearing the, 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 uh, the owner of the, of the ranch uh, talking to his father and basically telling, telling his father that when his father is no longer around, that Chunky can be, you know, a great foreman on the ranch. And Chunky's immediate thought is, wow, he says, they got my whole life planned for me. I got to get out of here. <laughs> uh, I don't think at that point he had a plan for how he was going to get out of there. But uh, one of the things that happened was uh, he had some, you know, very important uh, mentors. There was, there was um, who, uh, Miguel Figueroa, who we actually see in the film, Miguel Figueroa, who's interviewed, and his brother, Alfredo, who we don't see in the film. But the Figueroa family was a very important family in Blythe, very politically active. Actually, the founders of MAPA, the Mexican-American Political Association in Blythe. And Miguel basically uh, was responsible for bringing Chunky along with another, another you know, a half dozen uh, young Chicanos and Chicanas to San Diego, uh, basically to get them to get them to register or get them to, uh, um, you know, uh, try to uh, to to submit an application to San Diego State. He basically literally drove them from Blythe to San Diego, which is like about a four-hour drive, uh, filled out the applications, and then they went they went back the same day. And then, much to Chunky's surprise, he actually was admitted to San Diego State, and he he came here actually in to San Diego State in in January of 1970, right at the very beginning of the 1970s, and basically got involved right away with um, with other young young Chicanos who were in many cases coming from rural areas. Uh, they particularly got involved with uh, with Pepe Villarino, who was a young professor who taught music there, and they got involved with this. Uh, really what we would call an estudiantil, a, a, a student musical group that uh, was named La Rondaya Amerindia de Atzlan. And essentially this group, which was just young people like Chunky, really, you know, in their, in their young, you know, late teens and early 20s, uh, basically started uh, essentially traveling uh, all around the state, uh, particularly getting connected to the United Farm Workers and to Cesar Chavez. And they uh, became very important in, uh, in rallies that, that Set Chavez was having. He certainly, Chavez, I think, as we say in the film, he understood the incredible importance of music in terms of, you know, getting people engaged and inspiring them in, in sort of in a way that can be a lot more powerful than, than words. And so Chunky really, you know, this was part of his formation, you know, to, to see the power of music, the power of performance in, in political uh, activism. And then I think uh, at the same time or around the same time in uh, 73, again, which we detail in the film, Chunky uh, goes to Mexico City for the first time and basically just happens to get there at a time when there is a major concert going on of Latin American protest music. And he essentially uh, meets uh, a number of really important figures like Mercedes Sosa and Gavino Palomares uh, and other, other musicians that were very engaged, Latin American musicians who were uh, very engaged with using music in terms of you know, political engagement, political protest. And I think that also really, uh, and in they invited him to play and he played at this concert in Latin America. But also I think it really gave him a, a model for, for the importance of how music could be used in, in terms of political engagement. And he returned, you know, really fired up. That's when he then goes on to found his own group, which was primarily initially his brother, Ricardo, and then a number of other musicians that joined him. But uh, that was, you know, a very significant moment in, in for him to, you kind of also connect, I think, also the sort of this whole issue of a transnational perspective about about political issues, you know, which of course was very much, I think, already embedded in Chunky as somebody who was, you know, grew up in the border, but it was just, you know, reinforced by by what he was doing. And I think we obviously, uh, I think that's another important theme in the in the film is the way in which Chunky, you know, basically pulls takes from both sides of the border, both in his music and and culture, and manages to you know, see this as a powerful way of, of, about identity, even though at the same time, as, as we say, you know, there's sort of a way in which that identity is being um, sort of harassed by both on the American side and the Mexican side. Uh, one of his really important songs that we play in the film is the song Pocho, which is basically Pocho is sort of a derogatory term that Mexicans would sometimes use towards Mexican-Americans 
sort of uh, talking about how, you know, they're not Mexican enough, they don't speak Spanish well enough, but he sort of takes that and, and kind of claims that for, for his for himself. And that was part of, I, I would say, part of the, the Chicano movement really was taking even Chicano itself, the term Chicano, Chicana was something that wasn't, you know, widely um, used by the, the older generation and sort of say, taking that and really, um, you know, claiming it and, and putting pride around that. So that was also something that was really important, I think, for, for Chunky and for his, you know, our generation. Yeah, and that that piece in the film was so, uh, I thought you captured brilliantly the, this is a powerful transformation of his. As you said, he comes back from Mexico and he has this realization. And I, I was struck by, as you mentioned, he was such a compelling speaker and how he so commonly blended spoken word with music, right? And, and or played uh, his songs with a, a running commentary through the, you know, through the, through the, the piece, or he would introduce the piece in, in spoken word while beginning to play and then kick into, but this kind of mixing of what I think of as spoken word, it's very much, a, you know, uh, de jure today, but I don't think it was the thing back then, right? But his, this idea that he was in using both languages and flipping back and forth uh, within phrases, uh, within pieces, singing in both English and Spanish, uh, this, you know, and, and embracing this, this duality or hybrid uh, experience of the borderlands in such a, a powerful way. Is that, am I capturing some of what you think of as his unique contribution to the musical uh, palette of our, of, a, of our time? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think basically, certainly the whole, you know, by, by, by nationalism, by, by culturalism that he, that he, that was really a part of him that he, you know, demonstrated on the stage and certainly in a sense was uh, t telling that story to a larger audience for, on, you know, on behalf of, of the Chicano community, basically, that he was obviously part of. And so I think that's definitely one of his major contributions. I mean, I, I wouldn't say that he was alone in that. Uh, there were other, certainly other musical groups. There was, and we detail a few of them that some of them not, not so well known, but you know, in different places in San, in, in San Jose and in San Antonio, even in Chicago, there were, there were definitely other musicians that were, I would say, uh, capturing some similar kinds of ideas and sentiments and, and, you know, weaving together this bicultural, you know, mix of, of, of performance and, but also in a sense, responding to the, to the, uh, the situation that, that, uh, that Latinos broadly speaking and Mexican Americans in particular found themselves in, which was often, uh, you know, very much in a situation of being discriminated against, uh, being, you know, seeing, seeing certainly the, 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 the history of their own particular communities and not feeling, you know, happy with the world that they were viewing and, and wanting to change that. I mean, certainly they were part of the larger, you know, civil rights movement that was going on at that time, the, the, the African-American civil rights movement, as well as the, the women's movement and, you know, the Native American movement. There was really a whole, this was all part of, part of the, you know, the, the, the kind of the 60s and 70s, you know, period where, where people were really saying, you know, they, they wanted a different world than the world that they, that they saw. And they particularly, you know, felt that they had been, you know, um, you know, displaced or, or that would be even too kind of a word for some of the kinds of uh, actions that they were aware of that had happened to their community. And, you know, really uh, demanding, demanding a place at the table, so to speak, and demanding uh, change, both uh, social, political, economic change. Which you know obviously is a larger, a larger process, but certainly they were certainly part of that. Yeah, yeah. Let, I want to pick up on that, but I'm also seeing in the chat room people just wanting to see an image. So I'm going to share the image, which is from your uh, 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 the film's website. This is an image of of Chunky Sanchez. Uh, that would have been in the 1970s, I'm guessing, uh, Paul. Yeah, yeah. That would have been from the 1970s. I don't know. I mean, maybe if you think you can play the trailer, the trailer's like a minute and a half long. It, it might be. Um, yeah if you want to try to do that this let me do that let me do that time. yeah and at the same time while i'm getting that queued up paul people are asking where would they see the film uh or how are, are opportunities to, to see it uh, even now yeah well basically i mean the film has been sort of on a well prior to covid it was on a festival circuit uh we were we were showing it in festivals and, and starting to screen it also in uh, colleges and universities it's still we actually since covid began we actually have had quite a few uh, uh, virtual uh, festival screenings, as well as virtual, um, 
you know, screenings with college and university. In fact, we just did uh, last week a very nice screening at San Jose State University and a big uh, a screening in Visalia with actually high school students. Uh, the film is in educational distribution uh, with uh, a company called Good Docs, and maybe I can um, send you the link for, for sure. that. It's not hard to find, but actually you can go to my, my website, which is, uh, well, there's a website of chunkyfilm.com, chunkyfilm.com, which actually we're doing some work on right now. But anyway, uh, basic information about, uh, about the film is there, as well as on my site, uh, espinosaproductions.com. Those are both um, those are both places where you can get find out some more information about about the work that I've done as well as this film. Uh, we are in a sense still rolling it out. We do actually anticipate that the film will be on public television uh, at some point, um, but for now we are really sort of concentrating on on education and trying to get it into schools, uh, both both you know colleges and universities as well as high schools. And we've been I think pretty successful. I mean obviously COVID has been a uh, un, unknown factor in terms of that, but um, but uh, we I, maybe well. Also, if you go to chunkyfilm.com, you can sign up for our um, news and updates, and we will add you to our list about you know potential screenings. Uh, some of these are you know screenings done with institutions, so they may or may not be you know available. Actually, I think um, San Diego State just did a big screening uh, right before Chicano Park Day on April 23rd, I believe. That was I think uh, somewhat. Uh, available to the larger community. I, I'm not sure about that because of San Diego State yeah. sort of coordinate well, that, but um, well, but it is. Well, be, uh, you be sure to let us know, Paul. Next time there is one of these screenings that's available, and and I'll be sure to get the word out to our Via Voices network. And uh, uh, yeah, I appreciate this opportunity to at least see the trailer. Here's the here's the trailer that's available on ChunkyFilm.com, but I'll play it because I think this will give us a lovely feel and flavor for uh, for the music and the spirit. Uh, and I think the trailer is right here. I'm hoping you'll all be able to hear this. Chunky is absolutely Cesar Chavez's favorite musician. Whenever there was any kind of an event that the farm workers were having, Cesar would always call and say, can you get Chunky to come up and play for us? The strikes, we'd be with the picketers in front of the fields out there. People would be holding the loudspeakers. And pretty soon you'd see them coming out of the fields. Just kind of captured the spirit of what the whole struggle was about. And within a very short time, he starts to become an icon. I realized that you could take from both sides of the border and combine them and come up with a new style of music. At that time, many groups didn't create music, Chicano music. How did this young kid from a small rural town in the middle of nowhere become one of the leading musicians of the Chicano Civil Rights Movement and go on to receive one of his nation's highest musical honors? How did he and his generation find the courage to fight for social justice in the face of racism and discrimination? How did he learn to use music and imagination to take us on a journey a journey towards freedom. Well, I hope that, yeah, I uh, appreciate that uh, glimpse into the film. And uh, well, let's see, we were picking up the story with uh, your description of his uh, uh, kind of discovering this voice, uh, not him, he alone, but becoming really a voice and as mentioned in the film and highlighted there in the trailer, an icon of the Chicano civil rights movement. Um, he, he had the, his band uh, kind of, as you mentioned, his brother was his foundational partner, but his band went through several different transformations, as I recall, uh, uh, and his music uh, kind of continued to evolve. Uh, yeah, yeah, his group uh, was, well, his group was originally Los, Los Alacranes Mojados, so they basically again sort of reclaimed the uh, the mojado term, which again would be somewhat similar to uh, you know pocho, something that was seen sort of in in negative terms. But you know, and uh, well, in, in the film he also he talks about you know the very first the very first album that they created, and you know, and he was talking about like well where you know what was going to be on the front cover of the album, and and basically they decided that you know they should be like uh, you know climbing over a fence. 
And then they decide, well, we can't just be climbing over any old fence. It has to be, you know, we should climb over the fence, meaning the, the, the border fence. And so as, as Chunky said, that was at, at that time he could still climb a fence. But anyway, he um, yeah, there's the there's the cover of the uh, of the album, a, a picture by uh, a photograph by Memo Cavada, who's just recently passed away. Uh, may he rest in peace. But uh, Chunky tells a great story about, you know, actually taking that picture and the Border Patrol uh, basically, you know, showing up at the same time. And, uh, and then essentially, you know, having to, uh, you know, kind of explain what's going on. But, but anyway, um, you know, they, that group then continued really, that was the group that he had. There were different people uh, that were part of it. Uh, Mario Aguilar, who some people will know was a very well-known danzante still here in San Diego. Mario Aguilar and, and Marco Antonio Rodriguez, uh, also rel relatively well-known. Those were the core of that original group and his brother, the four members of the group. And that's the people that we sort of see in the film itself. But as time went on, there were other people, some members left and other people came in. Yeah. But Ricardo continued to be kind of a, a very, very core you know, person of the group. And actually one of the things that we've been able to do uh, as we've been doing some of these screenings you know, over the last uh, several years, particularly at uh, universities, is have Ricardo come and play or Ricardo along with some other musicians and play some of the music from that time period uh, before the film to sort of get people you know, into, into the mood. The, the rondaya that Chunky was a part of you know, way back when, uh, the, a lot of the members of the rondaya are still around. Pepe Villarino, who is you know, sort of the, the leader of the group. I mean, he was a professor basically, but he was actually not much older than the, the students in the group. Uh, he is still around and he's played, uh, you know, we play, had a very nice screening at Southwestern College, but the year, this is before COVID, where, where all of them came, all of they came about, came, and, and other members who are still, you know, Miguel Vasquez, who's a very talented musician. So that's been really nice. And, and certainly I think um, the film has not only spoken to, uh, you know, people that were part of the Chicano Civil Rights Movement, but I think people who are part of the larger civil rights movement who understand, you know, the importance of that period and also the the message that is still sort of ringing true today about the urgency of activism. And I mean, if anything, you know, it's even more true today when we see, you know, what, for instance, what's happened to the border itself. I mean, the fact that um, Chunky and his band could actually go out and take a picture on the top of the, of the fence, certainly you couldn't do that today. Um, and, you know, we've become so incredibly, you know, militarized in terms of the border. It's just, you know, when you think about the kind of resources that have gone on to that, got, gone into that and, and just, you know, I don't know, just basically complete, in my opinion, you know, misplacement of, of resources that we should be, uh, where we need to be placing resources. But, but anyway, I think there are many, there are many messages in, in Chunky's music and Chunky's life that still resonate today very strongly. And, and hopefully, you know, in, in expo exposing people to, to the story, I think people will see, you know, the value of that, you know, again, in some cases, actually learning, learning that history for the first time. I think one of the things that I, certainly felt, I, I've been making films about uh, sort of the larger history of the border region for some time. And it's always very, uh, one of the comments that I often get is people, you know, really don't know anything about that. I mean, it's something that they have never heard about. They haven't, it hasn't been part of their, their schooling and certainly in, in high school and sort of K through 12, maybe when they get to college, they start learning a little bit about, you know, the, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo and the way in which, you know, that the, the land that we're on right now, you know, uh, used to be part of Mexico and was part of, you know, Native American lands before that. And that history is not, is not particularly well known, the, the kind of the, the, the history of conquest and, and imperialism that, that our country has been part of. So I think, yeah. you know, exposing people to that and getting them to learn a little bit more about that has been another, you know, objective of, of my work, broadly speaking. Yeah, well, and let's chat a little bit about your broader work, and then maybe we can come back to uh, Chicano Park, which I think was a, a, so central to Chunky's uh, experience and so important to so many people in our network. But let's do talk briefly about your broader work. And I've just punched up here your website and uh, just this uh, a, a wonderful range of topics that you've addressed. And yet there is a, that uniting theme of, uh, uh, you know, of, of Chicano heritage and uh, Chicano the culture and heritage of the of the borderlands. Yeah, I remember. I think the first film I saw of yours, Paul, was the Lemon Grove incident. Which, yeah. uh, speaking of you know stories that are not widely known in among even you know probably residents of Lemon, I dare say the people in Lemon Grove itself, a lot of people don't know that story. Uh, just tell folks briefly what was the Lemon Grove incident, in case they aren't aware. Well, yeah. Well, thank you. Well, 
you know, basically, broadly speaking, I've been able to do a lot of work in, in the, the, this, this transnational region of the US-Mexico border, right? And uh, The Lemon Grove Incident is actually a film about the first successful legal challenge to school segregation anywhere in the country. This is in 1930 in Lemon Grove, California. This is 25 years before Brown versus Board of Education. And basically, you know, at this time, and, and really this is all, in a sense, goes back to Plessy versus Ferguson of the 1896 Supreme Court decision. But there were many, many, many attempts, not only attempts, but successful efforts to segregate uh, non-white children, which would be both, uh, you know, Mexican American, Latino, uh, Asian American, uh, Native American children, uh, in in the period from 1896 to 1954, when Brown versus Board of Education basically, you know, ends that that uh, sort of sad chapter of our history. I mean, ends it legally. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Um, so the Lemon Grove incident is basically a story about this. What I say is the first successful challenge: the, the Mexican American community in Lemon Grove. Uh, did not want to uh, allow the, the school board to segregate their children, which they wanted to do. And they sued the school board and they won, which was very, uh, really kind of amazing when you consider the time. This is night, the, the, the decision came down in 1931 when the, the, the very uh, massive repatriation program of President Her Herbert Hoover was going on. It was a very, this is the, the middle of the depression. There was a lot of scapegoating. There was a lot of, you know, uh, these people are just taking our jobs kind of uh, sentiments and and uh, and over uh, well the figures are hard to come by but let's say something like a million Mexican and Mexican Americans were deported back to to Mexico during this time period including people that were part of this lemon grove story so yeah. anyway that was that was definitely a, I think an important uh, film for me and for sort of kind of uh, you know sort of setting the record straight so, so to speak and letting people know something about Basically, for one thing, the long, the long battle that uh, Mexican Americans have had over education, that educational yep. equity is something that was very important for them and their children, and they were engaged in this battle, you know, way back when. Uh, so that that, but uh, as I say, I've had the opportunity to sort of look at the border, you know, over a long period of time. Um, yeah. The the U.S. Mexican War, which is a major series that I did for PBS and for Mexican television for Canal Once in Mexico City is really the first and only uh, look at the, the, the it's a four hour series on the war between Mexico and the United States, which was, of course, a very consequential event in both of our both of our histories. Uh, the hunt for Pancho Villa is about uh, the Mexican Revolution, the the um, the uh, the, uh, the the, the uh, Pancho Villa's, uh, you know, raids Columbus, New Mexico in 1916. And this results in uh, 10,000 American troops going into Mexico with uh, John Pershing, the American general. Uh, they're in Mexico for a year. There's 150,000 American troops uh, on the U.S.-Mexico border during this time, the largest uh, troop concentration since the Civil War at that time. Anyway, um, the, the U.S. troops are in Mexico for a year, and they, without ever catching sight of Pancho Villa, they declare victory and leave. <laughs> and um, so anyway, that's, that's a nice story. That, that has people that are interviewed that are, were around during that time period. Mm -hmm. um, the border, which is a series about, you know, looking at the U.S. Mexican border. This is pre 9-11, where we're trying to present kind of a little different uh, view of of what the border is all about. Uh, In the Shadow of the Law was a film was really one of the very first national films about life as undocumented families. This was a, a portrait of four undocumented families done in 1987 after the Immigration Reform Act of 1986 had passed, although we, we began this production before the bill had passed and we were looking at, you know, what it was like to live in the shadow of the law. And it was a profile, like I say, of four families that had been here actually for many, many years. Yeah. Uh, the new Tijuana, which was a, a film about, um, you know, really looking at Tijuana as a microcosm of, of dramatic changes happening in Mexico at the time. Uh, this is done in 1989, the, the centennial of Tijuana. And looking at, uh, for one thing, one of the stories is about Zeta, which is the still uh, independent uh, uh, weekly newspaper that was really a challenge to to uh, to things that were happening in Mexico and they were able to actually do that because they they actually produced their film on the uh, on the American side of the border yeah um, so anyway just a lot of I mean uh, my training actually was as a as a, an anthropologist I was actually trained as an anthropologist and I feel like I've been able to you know explore this region which is just rich with you know all kinds of stories I mean I've, I've had feel very lucky to have had the opportunity to basically uh, make so many of these films, but there's so many other stories that need to be made. And hopefully 
uh, you know, uh, there, there's some younger people who will get inspired to, or are being inspired to tell some of these other stories that really need to be told as well. Yeah, well, and I know you're very active uh, in fact, with the Media Arts Center of San Diego and encouraging the Latino Film Festival and encouraging young filmmakers. And uh, you've been supportive of uh, our effort to roll out a little film uh, around Friendship Park. And uh, so just appreciate your uh, collegiality and your, your collaborative spirit and your encouragement of others to explore this space. As people may have seen, if you notice, folks, uh, when I was uh, having my scroll, uh, you know, hovering over the uh, films there, you can catch a glimpse of these films on Paul's website. Uh, if you want to just uh, see a trailer or perhaps learn more about them. Uh, Paul, before I open it up to the larger room, let's, I do want to return back to the theme of Chicano Park, just because it's so central to the life of Via International. Uh, Rigoberto Reyes, I think, is in the room with us. I'm not sure if he's available to chat, but um, and so many people within our network were centrally involved with Chicano Park across many years, as was Chunky Sanchez. I gather he was the, the president of the Chicano Park Steering Committee. I, Elisa tells me in, in uh, the chat that his uh, uh, wife is still very active uh, and he has a wonderful song. I'd love to play it, just two minutes of the Chicano Park song from Chunky before we close. Maybe we can do that as our closing. But uh, how, tell us about uh, your experience uh, with or your pers perspective on Chunky and Chicano Park. All right, well, Chunky was basically going back to, you know, when Chicano Park, you know, ha you know the, the, the takeover of Chicano Park was April of 1970. Chunky had, you know, just come to San Diego and he was part of uh, a larger, you know, student group that basically, you know, went down to Chicano Park. I mean, it heard about that the, the community was that there was, well, this basically that they were attempt, they were going to put a sheriff substation there underneath the bridge and community members just basically were very upset about it. And they went out and essentially protested this. Uh, lots of community members uh, that were, you know, that are honored today in, in with murals there in the park. And Chunky was part of that. He was a young person. And he, as he says in the film, he says, I didn't know, you know, what this was all about, but uh, I didn't call it a movement at the time, but whatever it was, I wanted to be a part of it. So he really, you know, uh, you know, cut his teeth, so to speak, on, on that, that event. And then, of course, then he memorializes the event in his very famous, the song you just mentioned, Chicano Park Samba, yeah. which is probably one of his best known songs, which actually is a perfect example of spoken word, as you were saying earlier, yes. spoken word, which is where he basically tells the story by by speaking about it. And then it's a samba, which again is a very, not as exactly a typical, you know, border, uh, you know, trope in terms of the, the musical style. But, you know, obviously it was very, is very significant in his, in his life. And then he became part of the Chicano Park Steering Committee, which is a larger group of people that have really been dedicated to preserving the heritage of, of Chicano Park. And in fact, as I'm sure many of the people here, may hopefully people know that there's going to be a Chicano Park uh, Museum. Uh, Josie Talamantes, who's, who's in the film, uh, was, uh, is, is a very important person uh, involved. She's on the Chicano Park Steering Committee, but also been one of the leaders in, in really helping to move this uh, Chicano, well, first off, to move Chicano Park to be part of the National Historic Register, which, yes. it, which it is now, because really thanks, I think, to, to Josie uh, in particular. Josie was also actually responsible for, we, we see, uh, we mentioned in the trailer that Chunky gets this major honor from the National Endowment for the Arts, which is a National Heritage Fellowship, which he received in 2013, which honors uh, folk and traditional artists from all over the country, not necessarily just musicians, but uh, artists of various types. And Josie was part of the, uh, you know, getting that nomination of getting Chucky nominated for that. Uh, and, you know, which was really a, a wonderful award, which we, which we include in the film. In fact, the film ends with Chunky receiving this award and playing one of his really terrific songs, Rising Souls, where he talks about, you know, we need to educate, not incarcerate. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's kind of the, the close of the, of the film. But anyway, uh, Chicano Park is, you know, I think uh, really a, a fantastic example of people power. I mean, this is something where, this is something in 1970, where people basically said, we're not going to let the the powerful institutions do this to our community, and they were successful in stopping that, but they're also successful in, in creating a, a long-term park, which is still around. And I'm sure people that here in San Diego, people know that, you know, Chicano Park Day is a wonderful uh, annual celebration. Unfortunately, these last year, which would have been the 50th anniversary, uh, it wasn't able to be celebrated because of COVID, but I, I know that Certainly next year, hopefully we'll be in a different situation with regard to COVID, but I think it's going to be a, another fantastic celebration and it brings people from all over, well, all over San Diego, as well as all over, you know, all over the country, many people who know Chicano Park and really, you know, um, know the importance of the, the, the it's really an example of, of people struggling and community struggling and managing to, to take, uh, uh, 
you know, uh, uh, an example of self-determination, basically, on, on yeah. their own part. And, and, and of course, they've been just beautiful murals, of many, many well-known uh, Chicano muralists, Chicano artists who've painted the murals. And then also it's been, you know, redone, redone in the sense of uh, renovated. So it's not, it's not the, the murals will be able to be there for a longer period of time. There's a, a longer history that somebody else probably can tell than me about, yeah. about that whole process. But anyway, it's certainly something that I think has become very important in terms of just uh, San Diego history. And, and certainly, is, I think, to some extent, the city maybe finally begrudgingly has acknowledged that as an important historic site. If you come to San Diego for whatever reason, uh, visit Chicano Park. And, you know, so anyway, there's a lot of a lot of history there, a lot of culture there that's very important. Wonderful. Well, you know, I'm, I'm going to open it up for uh, questions from our, our uh, audience here in the, the Zoom room. But first, I just want to play two minutes of that Chicano Park song, kind of a little bit of tribute. We can hear Chunky's uh, music and voice as we close out this uh, part of the conversation. And uh, uh, you feature this this music, I, as uh, rightly so, in, in your film. Uh, but I thought just if we, well, you know, it's about a five minute song. It's a little long to, to listen to in yeah. its entirety. But the opening, as you describe, uh, does include this kind of uh, a narrative of sorts into the, 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 the rise of the Chicano Park uh, uh, occupation. So here's just a, here's a glimpse of a, uh, Chunky Sanchez's music uh, in the form of his song, uh, Chicano Park. Thanks, uh, Paul. Uh, thanks again for capturing the spirit of Chunky Sanchez so wonderfully. Uh, thanks for your larger uh, work. I know your papers are now at uh, UCSD, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, there's a collection right. there of, of some of your papers and, and, uh, and films. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, one of the things I did uh, a number of years ago was, uh, of course, making these films. I have a huge amount of, of documents related to let me make, well, any of these films. There have been large amounts of uh, interviews that were done, pre-interviews and transcripts of many, many people. I mean, the Lemon Grove incident, for example, we interviewed probably 75 people uh, when we made that film. And I think those interviews themselves are important, but 
uh, all of my, or uh, not all of them, because actually I'm still, I'm still working on some projects, but anyway, um, a lot of the work that I had done uh, over the years I did, I had been looking for a home for and decided to donate my papers to the University of California at San Diego. And I've uh, been very happy to, that they were, you know, they found a home and they've actually, they are there and they're actually, they've done a, I think a really great job of indexing, you know, a lot of the materials. And I do, I do expect, uh, you know, in the future to donate more. I actually, at the time I did the, the, uh, the donation, I hadn't finished the chunky film. So, but I, it, at some point I certainly uh, anticipate uh, donating additional materials uh, to, to UCSD. So yeah, for those who are interested um, there, there's a pretty, considerable cache of, of material related to my work over many, many years uh, related to all the films. And as John said, if you go to espinosaproductions.com, you can see uh, basically just uh, the productions, some of the different productions, and there's, uh, there's a little uh, clip of, of each of them that you can at least see, get an idea of uh, what some of those films are all about. So anyway, I invite you to, to do that if you're interested. Great. Well, let me uh, just uh, see if there's anybody else in the Zoom room who'd like to uh, ask a question before we uh, say thank you. We want to honor your time and close by the one o'clock hour. We have a few minutes. Is there anybody who'd like to uh, ask a question or share share a perspective with Paul? Yeah, Jim. Yeah, hi. thanks, Paul. That was uh, really terrific. And I feel like uh, uh, I got a uh, a great education about the border in this. It, I was just wondering if, if, if two questions, you know, one was uh, whether your films are, are available in the media centers of the local universities. Like if I go to San Diego State or UCSD, will they have copies of most of your films? And then secondly, in terms of Chunky's political development, what role, if any, did the Vietnam War play? Was that, was that an issue and just sort of, you know, looking out and seeing what's going on in the world? Yeah. Well, in terms of uh, my films, yeah, pretty much, I think almost all the local, uh, certainly San Diego State and UCSD and a lot of the even community colleges have some of my work. I mean, I think uh, San Diego State has a lot of it. Uh, uh, the community colleges would have certainly the Lemon Grove incident and the U.S. Mexican War. So yeah, uh, there's, I would say a lot of institutions, not just in San Diego, but you know, really all over the country. I've been fortunate that I think my work has resonated with a lot of uh, people who are teaching about different things and they, they recognize the value of these films. So I've been fortunate to have um, a lot of these films get distribution into colleges and universities in particular. In terms of the Vietnam War, um, well, definitely, I mean, I mean, Chunky, obviously, he, well, I mean, maybe not so obviously, he didn't go to Vietnam, he wasn't, he wasn't drafted. But I certainly think that his, he was certainly aware of the larger, you know, anti-war protest that was going on. In fact, in the, in the, in the film, we, we do have um, an interview from Gus Chavez, who was a, a good friend and was a, the EOP director at San Diego State, and talked about how uh, really the, the anti-war um, sentiments, you know, made their way into some of Chunky's songs themselves. And certainly, I think he was he was aware of. I mean, you know, the the late 1960s uh, and the early 70s were a you know a major watershed moment in our in our history in terms of you know uh, uh, social protest, not just the the civil rights movement, but the anti war protest, which really came together almost you know together in terms of you know vast you know popular consciousness, and that was certainly something that I think had an impact on, on him in terms of you know I don't know. What the whole not not only just being against the war, but raising questions about the role of the government, the role the government played, and the which you know obviously continue to this day in terms of you know kind of how how you know our whole military industrial complex that we've been warned about by by many people over the years, but seems to be growing and growing and without without end. Something that I think is uh, needs you know constant vigilance. I mean, we need to really do whatever we can to to. Put the brakes on that, but you know we're top, we're up against very powerful uh, corporate forces, basically that uh, essentially, for all practical purposes, you could say you know they they sort of own our legislators. They've they've managed to put a uh, a military establishment in the in pretty much in the district of every single congressman that there are, that there is uh, very strategically, so that you know doing something against the military becomes very 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 difficult. But when you look at you know when you basically look at our social infrastructure. 
uh, which even pre-COVID, we ought to, it ought to been a, we ought to have been aware that that you know our social infrastructure is deteriorating. You know our 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 schools, our parks, our 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 roads, and you know where is where is the money that we're paying taxes? Where is that money going to? Well, a big chunk of it is going into the military industrial complex, while all of these other things suffer. Our our hospitals, you know, all of that. So. We need, a, we need a radical rethinking of how, you know, how our resources are spent. And I realize I'm probably speaking to the, to the choir here, preaching to the choir, but uh, we, we certainly need to find, you know, new ways to, to uh, re, re, uh, you know, reset the priorities, the financial priorities that we have as a country. Yeah, thanks for that, Paul. Thanks for extending that legacy from uh, the activism of the 60s and 70s. A lot of the folks in the uh, our network, we realize for these, especially for these midday lunches, uh, these, you know, these midday weekday conversations are folks of this generation, right? I'm on the very right. tail end or the young end of the baby boom generation, but that, that baby boom, uh, you know, those formative experiences of the baby boom generation are, are really, uh, you know, here we are, right? All of us with our gray hair and our <laughs> still trying to work, work through some of the implications of those social movements that were launched, uh, you know, 50 years ago, right? Uh, anybody else have a, a question or a comment? Uh, Rigo, were you able to join? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, th thank you, Paul, for, for, for agreeing and being with us. And I apologize for, uh, for not having the video. Ironically, I'm right at the border. I'm about a mile away from the border. And therefore, my connection is not that good. But in any case, thank you. Uh, I am a proud member of the Chicano Park State Committee. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for even uh, mentioning it. In a sense, because uh, in the film, I know it wasn't it wasn't highlighted, but uh, the, a lot of the work that Chunky did, uh, as it pertains to Chicano Park, was was very very important. Uh, I think John alluded to it as far as uh, him being being the chairperson of the Chicano Park State Committee during the mid '80s, late '80s. But in any in any case, th once again, th thank you for uh, for acknowledging that. One, the question that I had, and again, you might have answered already because I was off and on, you know, I got cut off of at least two, 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 two times. Uh, but uh, my question is in regards to, uh, to his immediate family. How much, how much involvement did they have on, 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 on uh, when you were documenting this film? Yeah, no, well, thank you. And thank you for your comments uh, about the film and about, you know, I really appreciate it about the Chicano Park Steering Committee and the work that you've done over many years. It's really been important work. Well, definitely, you know, his family was involved. We, you know, we did, uh, we did work with his family very closely with Isabel, his wife, of course, and his children, all of his children are, you know, I, I know all of his children, and they were certainly, uh, you know, helpful and supportive of the film. We've been, we've been very uh, happy that we've been able to screen the film on, on different occasions with members of the family, uh, both actually one of the very first people that saw the, that saw the film were, were Isabel and the immediate family, as well as uh, perhaps you know one of the very first screenings was a screening down in 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 Logan Heights at the uh, at the Logan Heights Public Library that Isabel helped coordinate with with sort of family and extended family of Chunky, which was we're talking about you know several hundred people, um, and then also we've had the opportunity to screen it. You know, Esme, his daughter Esme, is in Arizona. We did a very some very nice screenings there in Arizona uh, with her. But no, his family, I think, is, is very important. Of course, his, his, his uh, children, his two sons were musicians, also are musicians who played, you know, played with him over the years. So uh, I think certainly uh, the film is going to be part of the larger, you know, legacy for Chunky because, you know, obviously now having passed, uh, you know, his, his, the, the importance of his, of his life and his work, you know, needs to be carried on in some way. And I think the film will be uh, hopefully part of that uh, part of you know c continuing the legacy of the work that he that he did so so wonderfully during his life right thank you and and yes i was i was there the, at the long Heights library when you first uh, when you first uh, broke it out so thank you for that also well thank you thank you very much well very good uh paul i'm just going to make a, a quick plug that next uh tuesday uh 12 o'clock noon our via voices series continues and our friend jim gerber uh, we'll be interviewing uh, David Shirk of the University of San Diego. Uh, David is uh, an expert in uh, Mexican politics and law and uh, crime. Uh, and he'll be, uh, Jim will be interviewing him about uh, his Justice in Mexico project, uh, among, other, uh, among other things. So uh, please join us next Tuesday and Jim Gerber uh, will lead the conversation about those important themes. 
Uh, for today, we thank you for joining us. If you're watching on Facebook and want to join us on Zoom, just drop us a line. You can sign up at viacafe.org and we'll get you into the Zoom room next time. And uh, Paul, once again, thanks uh, for uh, being with us today. Thanks for your for the film, uh, Singing Our Way to Freedom, and thanks for your larger work and your uh, continuing contributions to, uh, uh, to this part of the world and those who call it home. We really appreciate you and uh, are glad to have had you with us today. I'll just invite the folks uh, with us to join me in a big round of applause. Well, thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you for the invitation to participate. And yeah, it's been great to be to have this conversation with you. And I you know, look forward to continuing the conversation in the future. So take care, all of you that joined us today. Thank you.